everyone. Uh, welcome to another New Economics Briefing. Uh, it's a place to discuss the biggest issues of the day with the wider NAF community. Uh, it's really great to have so many of you on here this evening. Uh, please do, I know some people have been doing this already, just like write your name, like where you're calling in from, if you're part of an organization in the chat. Uh, my name is Fergal. Uh, I work in NEF's campaigns team, uh, and we're currently engaged in uh, NEF's Great Homes Upgrade campaign. It's a really exciting campaign to retrofit Britain's homes with insulation and create good green jobs in the process. Uh, on the morning of Wednesday, the 9th of March, we're going to be holding a celebration of retrofitting outside Parliament uh, and the Treasury with our allies, calling for uh, Great Homes Upgrade. Uh, we want as many people to come along as possible to show that there's big popular support behind the idea of retrofitting. So if you're in London and you wanna come down and show your support, you can RSVP on the link that we're gonna post in the chat now. Um, and yeah, just do get involved. Uh, so today we're gonna to be talking about the cost of living crisis and its connection to issues of climate justice. With inflation set to rise to 8% in April and energy bills soaring by hundreds of pounds we're in the brink of an eye-watering rise in the cost of living. The fact that this takes place in the context of a decade of stagnating wages, rising prices and erosion of the welfare state will make the coming, coming storm all the more difficult to weather. Of course, the crisis won't affect everyone equally. NEF research has found that the impact of the energy bill rises will hit the poorest families 7.5 times harder than the richest. As Britain's wealthiest MP, Rishi Sunak, tells us that we just have to adjust to higher prices when faced with up to £700 in extra energy bills. And the governor of the Bank of England warns of wage restraint whilst taking home a salary in excess of half a million pounds. Is this just the same old story of the poorest in society tightening our belts whilst the rich continue to get richer? But why is this all a climate issue? When Shell and BP record record profit forecasts of almost 40 billion in 2021 and 2022, at the same time as a looming energy price hike for the rest of us, something has clearly gone very wrong. The oncoming spread of fuel poverty caused by that hike shows in stark terms that climate justice issues are not abstract, far away or in the future, but affecting working class people in the here and now. The climate movement needs to respond to these material concerns as a key site of struggle in the coming months and come up with solutions to the problems that most of us will be facing. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about this evening uh, with four fantastic guests. So in a minute, we're going to hear from Miata van Buller, CEO of NEF. Uh, then we'll move on to Lucy Middlemiss, Professor of Environment and Society at Leeds University. Then we'll hear from Maria Marshall, a project officer at the Independent Food Aid Network, before wrapping things up with Alexa Wild. Uh, co-director of Fuel Poverty Action. In terms of like how we're going to structure this event, the speaker is going to talk one after the other, uh, and then they're going to answer a follow-up question directly from the chat. Uh, and we really want this to be a space that you guys can put your questions to the speakers. Um, so please do, as the speakers are talking, um, post your questions for them in the chat, and we'll do our best to ask those questions to the speakers. We really want to make this feel as interactive as possible um, and give you the chance to ask your questions. So do keep that comment and chat box uh, nice and lively. Um, and as ever, please do tweet about the event uh, this evening with the hashtag NEF Briefing to help us spread the word and get even more people engaged in the discussion. Okay, uh, let's go to our first speaker now, Miata Fambula. Uh, Miata, could you give us an overview of the cost of living crisis to kick things off? What's driving it? What's going to happen next? And, and what should the government do about it? Brilliant. Thanks so much, Ferg. Um, and hello, everyone. Absolutely delighted to be joining you this morning. I do have to send apologies. My children, children are making their way up to uh, bath time. Very, very noisy. So if you hear noise in the background, that's them going up the steps. Uh, so look, I just wanted to provide a little bit of context uh, to the cost of living crisis where the roots of it lie and actually what's going to happen next and where uh, and how the government ought to respond. For me, the crisis is, you know, and the thing that people are about to endure, which I think is going to be really painful and really profound, I think is the kind of economic fallout from the pandemic. It's still there. We're feeling it. We're feeling the aftershocks. Now, you know, the government has been telling us that we're bouncing back at an extraordinary rate. But I think that had always, and certainly now, belies the fact that our economy was one of the hardest hit, which is why, you know, when you look at the growth figures, they look high, but from a very low base. 
But, but more fundamentally, the fact that the aftershocks of that economic crisis are being felt in people's lives, are being felt in the real world. Uh, you know, as Fergus said, we know that we're seeing inflation at a 30 year high, 5.5% uh, could top 7 to 8%. But, you know, underneath those headline numbers is a story about rising prices that are squeezing people across the country. And the poster boy of the cost of living crisis is obviously energy and energy prices. And, you know, here the numbers are absolutely staggering. Uh, energy prices have already gone up by about 23% last year, which is pretty hefty hike in the first place. We are expecting to see a further rise of over 50% in April, so 600 to 800 um, pounds on average, um, you know, to the, to the average bill. 14 billion uh, across UK uh, bill, um, bill pairs across the country. But, but as Ferg said, the impact of this we know is not being felt even, evenly. We know that the poorest households will see their energy bills rise by about 12% of their household budgets. It's about five times uh, the proportion for the top 10%. We're expecting to see about 6 million people uh, who will be in fuel poverty. Uh, that's up from about 2 million. But it's not just energy prices. You know, that is the place boy. That's the thing that we're all talking about. But we are seeing rising prices across the peaks. We're seeing rising food prices, clothes, shoes, housing costs, all the day-to-day -day essentials. So people are being hit from every angle. But I think for me, the thing that makes us feel so profound, I think the thing that makes it feel so painful is that it comes off the back of a decade in which living standards had barely budged. You know, we pretty much entered the pandemic with living standards having flatlined since 2008 driven in no small part by the fact that we had pretty much a decade of stagnating wages, hitting those on low and middle incomes the hardest. Um, and, you know, I, I always say this, but it's worth just reflecting on how completely remarkable that is. Now, that's the longest period of earning stagnation we've seen for about 200 years. So, you know, in that world, we saw big squeeze in the income for those in the middle, uh, but we've also seen living standards held back for the poorest in our society, inequalities rising, making the UK probably quite an international outlier in terms of poverty. You know, the extent to which the poorest families fell below the poverty line in this country was the second highest in 37 OECD uh, countries. And the impact in total of all of this is even before this moment, this cost of living crisis that we're talking about, you know, families went into the pandemic already eating hand to mouth, paycheck to paycheck with very little cushion to weather the storm. And then you have the pandemic, you have the aftermath and the aftershock, and that what makes this feel so incredibly painful. Um, the research that we've done and we've published suggests that actually, you know, we already have one in three households, one in three households that are living on an income in which they are struggling to stay afloat, they're struggling to make ends meet. And that was before the bite of the cost of living crisis. Uh, we already had the situation where a shocking 45% of all children will be living in households with incomes in which they cannot afford a basic quality of life. And that was before energy bills were due to increase by 50%. Um, and the thing that is staggering for me is at the same time as all of this was happening, we were seeing our social security safety net, our social insurance system absolutely hammered. And I think the sheer inadequacy of it is hitting us at this moment in time. Um, you know, this was the case uh, even before the chancellor made that atrocious decision to cut the £20 uplift to universal credit at the last budget. And by the way, if he had kept that, that would have absorbed a big chunk of the increase in prices that we're about to see through energy prices. But even there, you know, even with that £20 uplift, it was only replacing a quarter of the cuts to social security payments that we'd seen since 2010. So for me, the two lessons when I look at the crisis and the two things it tells me, the two things I think ought to inform our policy response is on the one hand, we have got to bake in the principle that there must be an income level by which no one is allowed to fall so people can absorb these shocks. So it means that when you have these moments, people aren't pushed into destitution. Um, and that's why we've been calling for a living income. So 
building uh, an adequate income floor into the social security system so that everyone has that safety net in order to weather these types of storms. And then this should be combined with a dogged focus on reversing this trend of stagnating wages. Because the thing that makes price rises so painful is the fact that they're coming off the back of the fact that wages have either not moved or in fact have been declining real terms. Driving up the minimum wage so it reflects the true cost of living should be the first step. The living wage or the national living wage that the government talks about should be a mark that measures the true cost of living. And driving that up will allow a ripple effect across the income scales, um, um, up, up the income scales. And that should then be backed by actually to strengthen work of voice, and collective bargaining power so that we can push up wages uh, through collective action as well as action on um, productivity. But the second piece for me, the second thing I think we learned through this crisis, and this is the piece that takes us to the climate response, is that we should be accelerating and firming the urgency to accelerate the transition to net zero, not retracting from it. Um, and, you know, for me, the two things is that if, if we were to have increased the levels of renewables, we wouldn't be seeing the type of crisis that we're seeing. So the absolute imperative for the government should be to increase renewables, but critically to be retrofitting all of our homes. And actually, if there was a national resolve to do that at pace over the course of the next five years, that would be one of the way in which we could mitigate against rising energy prices that we're going to see not just for one year, but probably for a number of different years. Um, and would be able to give all households the security to know that you're living in a warm, decent home that doesn't cost an absolute, um, uh, absolute load in order to heat. So... The thing that I found quite interesting about the debate is that it's been quite short term issues, short term responses, uh, a VAT cut, uh, cut uh, to fuel bills, uh, a loan from the government, which is, an, which is a ridiculous intervention, um, the warm homes discount. These are all OK short term interventions. But for me, we ought to be responding to this crisis in a way that tries to deal with some of the structural issues. And if we were to deal the question of minimum income through a living income, and we were to deal with the question of how we both build out our renewables and invest in that, but also critically retrofit our homes at the speed and pace that we were our need to, we would need to, we would not only respond to the short term and the here and now, but in a way that insulates us going forward. So that's my two takeaways and I will leave it there, Berg. Thanks so much, Miata. That was fantastic. And yeah, really nicely linked to some stuff that NEP is currently engaged in. Um, the living income campaign that Miata just mentioned uh, is another thing that it'd be really great if people on the call wanted to get involved in. Um, so I'll post a link for how you can do that in the chat now. Um, I've just been looking, there's been quite a few questions coming in. Um, there's quite a good one here from uh, Ken Barker. Uh, Ken asks, thinking of Jack Munro's campaign on food prices, how can we strengthen more relevant price uh, indices uh, with the ONS? Do you, do you have a, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so. yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think, you know, that that work has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, and I think it has really forced policymakers to stop and think um, because the set of indices that we use is pretty arbitrary. Um, it's a basket that clearly doesn't reflect um, what pat families, in particular poorer families, are feeling. I mean, I've taken heart um, with the fact that the ONS has actually stopped uh, and responded, it said that it's going to think about ways in which it could make the basket of goods that it uses to define CPI a little bit more reflective. Um, but for me, I think it speaks to a bigger need for policymakers to be thinking about the distributional impact of policies. You know, when you're looking at aggregate numbers, when you're looking at things in the abstract, I think it can be a bit divorced from the realities of people's lives. And, you know, to be honest, I think if we had better understanding of how price rises and other things were affecting families and that we had a better read across to that, I think we'd be making better policy. I think we would have seen a budget, for example, that was doing far more on the cost of living crisis because it recognized just how profound it was. But at the time I looked at it, I was like, it's almost like they don't believe it's happening or can't see it's happening, but it's coming down the track. So I think this is the first step, encouraging noises, but there's a lot more that we need to do to track and measure the things that are impacting on people's lives. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't come back to well-being. Um, so for me, actually, what are the measures and in the indices that governments are looking at about across the piece? And to what extent do we need a better basket that reflects 
how people are feeling and living and living well, rather than the sort of metrics that we use. Thanks, Miata. It was all incredibly useful and like really good to get some of that kind of top level stuff um, so that we can kind of dive down a little bit more uh, in the rest of the event. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so yeah, next we're going to hear from Lucy Middlemiss, uh, who's Professor of Environment and Society at the University of Leeds. Um, Lucy, could you talk in a bit more detail about how the sort of material issues that people are facing now connect with the climate crisis? And yeah, more broadly about the work that you've been doing um, and why it's important to ground issues of climate justice in, in the here and now rather than in the future and being abstract. Um, yes, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, I just wanted to say before I do that the, the metrics on fuel poverty are also really problematic in the sense that they're two years out of date and they don't really reflect changing costs in the way that they really need to. And so um, a similar campaign to that run by Jack Munro needs to happen, I think, in terms of revising those. But sorry, I'll get back to your question. So um, today I wanted to answer your question by talking about a project I'm involved in called Understanding Family and Community Vulnerabilities in the Transition to Net Zero. We're funded by the Nuffield Foundation and we're a team of researchers led by the Young Foundation and including colleagues at the University of York, Leeds and uh, Trinity Dub College Dublin. In the project, we're building a comprehensive understanding of how people are likely to be vulnerable to policy for net zero because we want to understand who will struggle to participate in the climate change agenda as net zero policies come in in order to better understand what a fair transition to net zero would look like. So based on this work, the main point I want to make today is that climate change action must take heed of the cost of living crisis and of inequality more broadly, the kinds of deep seated inequalities that Miata has just been talking about. Why? Because under net zero, big change is coming for families and communities, and not everyone has the same starting point or the ability to respond to such change. We really risk leaving people who are already experiencing a range of social and spatial inequalities even further back behind than they are today. In the first part of our project, we've looked in detail at current scenarios for net zero, as well as evidence of existing inequalities in each of the areas of life that the scenarios affect. And from this work, I'd like to share some simple messages with you about the intersections between poverty and inequality and climate change. The first then is to, that we have to understand a start by understanding where people are at. We're in the middle of this crisis, this cost of living crisis, and people are play, paying closer attention to poverty and inequality as a result. But for those of us working in this space, the crisis represents more of an intensification of existing social and spatial inequalities with larger numbers of people being impacted by social ills that we're quite familiar with, such as fuel poverty. The existing spatial and social inequalities that divide our society are, are really well known, very well evidenced, witnessed the Marmot reports on health inequalities, or indeed the very presence of a levelling up agenda. <laughs> From a climate perspective, inequalities in the present will, will inevitably affect how net zero policy is experienced by different kinds of people. But it's really noticeable in visions of net zero that this starting point of unequal opportunities is not deeply integrated into our thinking about the future. We think this needs to change. For us, starting where people are at means acknowledging that people have different abilities to engage in net zero as a result of social and spatial inequalities that have been detailed by Miata today already. These inequalities are financial. Families and communities where people have low incomes face a number of financial effects, such as the poverty premium, limited job opportunities, a fear of financial risk, which make it more challenging to engage in change. Inequalities are also patterned socially, being more likely to affect disabled people, people from ethnic minorities, people living in poorer neighbourhoods and regions and so on. These kinds of differences in starting point and result, resulting differences in ability to engage need to be best taken into in account into our planning for transition. However, it's also important to remember that people always have some kind of agency, some power to act. So my second point is we need to learn about people's agency and to find ways of promoting that agency. We know that environmental impact is tightly linked to income with low incomes resulting in low carbon footprints and vice versa. 
This is because people on low incomes have constrained access to resources, but people on low incomes are also finding ways to live decent and low carbon lives through their actions. We need to celebrate this and learn from people living on low incomes about how we can do better for the climate agenda. To be clear, I'm not saying here that poverty is okay because it's green, but rather that seeing people on low incomes as victims of their circumstances rather than agents of change is unhelpful and patronizing. At a minimum, this means ensuring that climate spaces are inclusive by watching our assumptions about change. For instance, we don't talk about giving stuff up to people who never had stuff in the first place or make out that the only, only expensive measures are important, such as owning an electric car. A more substantive approach is to promote and support political activism in this space, amplifying voices of people who have lived experience and creating, creating opportunities for activism for a fair transition to net zero. There are some really great examples of this happening in anti-poverty activism, which we can learn from. It also means finding out what gets in the way of people's agency, what prevents them from living decent and low carbon lives. This leads me to my third point. We need to look for leverage points and use them to boost change. In our work, we're finding evidence of important leverage points, social levers that can be relied upon to make things easier for people in the transition to net zero. Often these levers can work in both directions, either enabling or exacerbating change. But if you get these right, you can address both net zero and inequality goals together. To give an example, paying for policy measures using progressive rather than regressive means is a leverage point. For instance, using general taxation to pay for measures, spreading the cost more fairly, instead of putting levies on bills where everyone pays the same. We can certainly see that in the, in the case of energy bills. Leverage points can also be more cultural. So finding means of breaking environmentalism's association with middle class, white, non-disabled identities would be an important leverage point in my view. It's about allowing different types of people to access and own this agenda. Before I finish, I'd also like to point out that bringing together the agendas of poverty and inequality and climate change is particularly challenging because focusing on two goals at once can easily mean meeting neither. There are, of course, areas in which the goals conflict, where reducing carbon emissions will result in increased poverty or vice versa. But I think this makes my three key points particularly important. Understanding where people are now, looking for these opportunities for people to have agency, and supporting this by identifying leverage points to boost change, all, for me, important ways of trying to ensure a fairer transition to net zero. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lucy. Um, that was that was really really useful. That sort of doing that kind of framing that we we really think is really important about yeah grounding that uh, the reality of, of net zero in, in the here and now. Um, there are a few questions in the chat. One of them was just about if you could post a link to the project in the chat. I don't know if you're like able to do that. Um, so I'm sure more people would like to read it. Um, we had a question sent in by email, um, which you kind of spoke to a little bit. So maybe I'll try and have a go at sort of adapting it. But the question was basically, is there a mistake that campaigners and environmentalists are making, which makes environmental and climate issues seem like something only middle class people have the space to worry about, rather than something which would be hit, uh, hit the poorest hardest? And and because I think you spoke to that a little bit, I just wonder if you could give a bit more detail on like who's doing this well, like wh wh where you kind of see things um, in the environmental movement at the moment that are kind of like really like they've nailed their mastering on this or they're kind of like actually doing that work particularly effectively. Yeah, um, off the top of my head, putting me on the spot like that, I can't think of anything <laughs> immediately. <Sorry. Sorry. laughs> but but I would say that that it. The, the movement does have a flavor of, of middle classness and it tends to, I mean, when, one of the things that we found certainly when reading the scenarios of, for, for net zero, so thinking about fut possible futures, is they do read um, as if they're written in, in very many cases by, by people in, from a particular background. And what, what um, I, I think is really important is, is, is by having that sort of fairly unified vision of the future, which, which has a middle-class white um, non-disabled flavor, what you're not doing is letting, letting other people envisage their own futures that, that will also work under a net zero agenda. I, I feel like it's really important to allow different forms of environmentalism. So to allow disabled environmentalisms and, uh, and um, environmentalisms from other, from other minority communities in order to allow people people in um there are, i mean there, there is action on um on um 
uh, active travel, for instance, uh, happening from disabled groups, which is really, really fantastic. So there's, there is, I mean, where people can get involved and do get involved and start to have their own say in the in the agenda, it, it, that's really great. But um, sorry, names escape me on this first for the moment. But <laughs> totally fine. That was a really good answer. Thank you. Um, uh, I uh, there are a few other questions for you in the chat, but I think we're going to, need to move on. I wonder if you'd be able to just like you got to just sort of yeah commenting or answering any questions in the chat because it seems like people are really engaged with what you're talking about um, and wouldn't want anyone to miss out on the opportunity to ask you a question. Um, thanks so much, Lucy. Um, before I move on to our next speaker, I do just want to take a second to plug NEF Supporters Network. Uh, supporters donations help fund quite a large part of our work, including running events like this uh, and allow us to plan further ahead into the future. Supporters are currently powering our campaigns, including our Great Homes, up, homes Upgrade campaign uh, and Living Income campaign, which Miata mentioned in her speech. Um, and uh, yeah, basically we're looking to scale up our campaigns. Uh, and, and in order to do that and win the kind of change we need to see, we, we need to really scale up our supporters base. Uh, we're looking for hundreds more supporters in the next few months to really take our campaign to the next level. Uh, you can join our supporters network from as little as three pounds a month. Uh, if you are an F supporter on this call, then thank you very much. If not, then do check out the link that we're posting in the chat um, now. Um, great. Next, we're going to hear from Maria Marshall, who's Project Officer at the Independent Food Aid Network. Uh, Maria, could you talk to us about how the cost of living crisis is already impacting the need for food aid? And, and why should we view this in the context of cuts to the social security system more broadly? Um, and what can we do about it as well? <laughs> Thanks, Mark. I'm just going to share my um, screen quickly. Hopefully um, everyone can see the slides. Um, yes, yeah, so I really want to share the experiences of what our member organisations are seeing on the ground at the moment with the current cost of living crisis. Um, I'm talking on behalf of IFAN, the Independent Food Aid um, Network. Um, we've got um, over 550 independent food bank members across the UK and we campaign for um, a society without the need for food aid and for income based solutions um, to food poverty. So since the start of the pandemic, um, our member organisations have seen a drastic increase in the amount of people needing to use their services. Um, I'm just going to read um, this testimony from one of our members, um, um, Rajesh Makwana, um, Director of SIFRA in London, um, who's said that um, at the moment their levels are twice as high as they were pre-pandemic. They're seeing more people who've never needed to visit the food bank before, um, and they haven't seen new guest numbers this high since the peak of the pandemic in March, April 2020. Um, similarly, um, from Sue Wood from Hope Church in Hanslow says that um, they're supporting people for much longer periods of time, um, that in the current crisis, um, they're going to find it hard um, to get hold of the food, the donations of food that they're relying on, because a lot of people just aren't in the position to um, donate as generously as they have, they have been in the past. Um, some recurring themes that we're hearing from our members um, on the screen here is about this kind of new demographic of first time um, food bank users. So we're hearing um, anecdotally of a lot of people who may have given to the food bank before now needing to use the services themselves. Um, but yeah, really people that haven't seen themselves in this position before. Um, heating or eating is a phrase that we hear a lot as well, um, especially in the current crisis. So um, people that are already paying a poverty premium and reliant on expensive um, prepayment meters um, and often have exhausted their options, turning to the food bank. And like this example here in Huntingdonshire, somebody has been given a food parcel, but um, they don't have the means to be able to heat it up to eat it. Um, clients um, that are using the food bank long term is something else that we're hearing a lot. And the reality um, really is that food banks are no longer acting as an emergency um, service. Um, food banks usually have been set up um, and they thought that it was going to be a temporary service. They're responding to emergency in their community. But now more and more, it's something that people are relying on to be there long term and that the state is relying um, on being there long term as well. Um, the increase in in-work poverty, so our member organisation in Earlsfield said recently they've been holding sessions where they estimate about 50% of the people who are using the food bank have work of some kind. And, you know, work is often held up as a solution or route out of poverty, but um, the reality is that wages and um, unpredictable hours is just not enough to allow a lot of people even the most basic standard of living. 
um, and also the disproportionate impact that the current crisis is having on single people as well as families. Um, so with pe people that are single, um, are a huge demographic of food bank users, and this is reflected in our members as, and as well as the Trust or Trust network as well. So our member organisations are, are finding it really hard to see how they're going to continue to cope with the scale of distress that they're seeing. Um, food banks run on donations, they run on volunteers, and it stands to reason they don't necessarily have the resources to cope with this further increase um, in demand on the horizon, and nor should they be expected to. Um, we're hearing of um, member organisations making very difficult decisions about reducing the amount of food maybe in parcels to accommodate for more clients. Um, and again, that you know, they're worried that they're reliant on these donations that a lot of people um, can no longer afford to give. Um, an estimated 37 billion has been um, taken from the social security system in the last 12 years. Um, there's now thousands of food banks um, across the UK, as well as other food aid providers that also help people who can't afford food, like um, community kitchens, soup kitchens, social supermarkets, that kind of thing. Um, Food banks have been running a lot of schools um, and by the Salvation Army and the Trussell Trust. So the picture of this um, is really massive. Um, and obviously with inflation forecast to hit 7% in April, um, the Joseph Roundtree Foundation today warned that 400,000 people could be pulled into poverty um, by this real terms cut to income. And so unfortunately, the situation is, is set to get worse. And I think it's important to mention here also the picture of food insecurity more broadly. So I've been talking about food bank use. Oh, sorry, I'll try and go back. I mean, talk about food bank use, but the um, and the data that we have on food bank use is really shocking. Um, but the wider picture of people who are food insecure is even bigger than this. Um, so new food standards agency data shows that 15% of people in England, Wales and Northern Ireland um, were food insecure from the middle of 2020 to 2021. Um, just 4% of this um, reported using a food bank. It's still a massive number, but you can see that not everybody who is worried about running out of food or is, or is eating less um, is actually using a food bank. So in tackling this, IFAN's work is, is based in a cash first approach to food insecurity. I will talk a little bit more about it. This is an infographic that was produced by IFAN. Um, and the concept is, is simple, is that um, the only way that you're going to be able to solve the problem of food poverty and see a future where there won't be food banks is um, through through income based solutions, putting more money in people's pockets. Um, so this is a kind of ladder of different approaches you can take to food insecurity. Uh, number one, we have obviously adequate benefit payment, fair wages. That's a world where um, hopefully people will be able to afford um, their own food. Um, and then the, the end here, we have an emergency food parcel, which, you know, no matter how dignified the services that's giving it on its own, um, can't address um, the problem behind food bank use. Um, so how IFAN supports a cash first approach and um, firstly through promoting advice services and local cash first options. Um, one of the ways we do this is through our worrying about money leaflet project. So we've been developing local leaflets um, with stakeholder groups across the country. Um, the guides on where you can get um, financial help and assistance. And um, we make sure that frontline organizations that might be sending people to the food bank have copies of this. So people are able to access that information on how they might be able to claim benefits or improve their income before maybe having to use the food bank. And secondly, through advocating on a local or national level. So um, locally, we're calling for all local authorities to prioritize cash payments um, support for people in crisis. And nationally, um, always calling for benefit payments and wages to match the cost of living. And alongside other um, anti-poverty charities at the moment, calling for social security payments to be uprated in line with expected um, inflation at 7%. And you can see on our website um, the work that we're doing and, and how to get involved. Um, so it really goes without saying that, you know, all food banks want to put themselves out of business. They don't want to have to exist and they don't want people to have to use their services. Um, we've seen with the proliferation of food bank use and since the pandemic, um, a real rise in um, organisations um, giving surplus food um, to food aid organisations, um, which obviously, you know, the help is appreciated in the long term, but this is a short term um, solution. It's not going to... Um, it's not going to address those long term solutions that I was talking about before with a cash first approach. Um, there's a really powerful narrative that it's a kind of win win situation. If you have all this food waste and you have lots of people that can't afford to eat food, one problem can kind of solve the other. Um, but really, you know, it's not the case. It's quite an attractive um, approach, maybe by 
the government and channeling money into redistributing surplus is going to be cheaper than um, fixing the social security system. Um, this also can be quite attractive to supermarkets who can benefit from the credentials of, you know, minimizing waste when they're actually relying on voluntary organizations to deal with their surplus food. And we know that um, most food waste caused by supermarkets happens before the food ever reaches the shelf. So the idea that this is kind of fixing the food waste problem is false. And the third point is, you know, it's a question of dignity. Um, in reality, surplus food can be of varying quality. Ultimately, a lot of it's not going to be used either because it's spoiled or somebody has um, dietary restrictions or cultural preferences. If they're able to choose and afford their own food and buy it at the local shop, you know, you wouldn't have this waste. Um, I found supports the Plenty to Share campaign run by This Is Rubbish, and I really encourage people to go and have a look at what they do. And there's a contact on the, on the screen here. Um, but but like I find, I, I found them, um, they're talking about designing food waste out of the system and not conflating those two issues of food waste um, and food poverty. You know, they've got separate um, solutions um, and that we need to look at. So to conclude then, um, we know we're in an unprecedented crisis. Um, even before the pandemic, 43% of households on universal credit were food insecure. Um, we also know that food banks are a relatively recent phenomenon in um, response to austerity. 75% um, of independent food banks started operating um, in the last nine years, um, with over a third opening over 2012 to 2013. Um, and because food banks are a relatively recent phenomenon, you know, it really should be possible to reverse this kind of normalization of food banks and emergency food aid. Um, the UK has the sixth richest economy in the world, and we can really work together nationally and locally to shift the focus away from food as a response and back to cash first. Um, a glimmer of hope in this situation is in Scotland um, with the Scottish government's plan to end the need for food banks. Um, it incorporates the cash first model and you can read our response to the plan on our website. Um, but it is going to be interesting to follow that work and um, see how it might hopefully be replicated outside of Scotland as well. And finally, you know, the, the, the solutions to the crisis we're seeing at the moment have to be sustainable. Um, food surplus redistribution has been used to plug gaps in the short term, um, but in the long term, it's not going to do anything to combat inequality, um, enhance people's dignity and help the planet as well. And I'll stop screen sharing now. Thanks. Thank you so much, Maria. That was really comprehensive and really interesting. Um, there are a couple of quick questions in the chat, um, and I'll try and put them to you together because they kind of link up with each other. So Colin uh, has asked, what has been the impact of food price inflation on donations? Um, I don't know if that's something that you've noticed yet, um, but it'd be great if you speak to that. And then Margaret has asked, adding to Colin's question, how much uh, has Jack Monroe's work revealed how inflation is hitting food bank users particularly hard? Is that, yeah, just the work that they've been doing, is that something that's kind of, you guys have been aware of? And, mm -hmm. and yeah, it'd be interesting to hear more about that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Fox. So, yeah, so we don't have like solid um, data from our members on how um, the rising cost of food has been impacting on donations. Um, but um, anecdotally, we have um, been hearing that um, people are seeing a drop already. Um, and that is a concern. Um, Jack Monroe's work has been um, really brilliant in bringing attention to the impact that it's having on families. Um, during the pandemic, um, a lot of donations to our food banks um, were given in cash instead um, for obvious reasons because people weren't out um, shopping as much um, and that was um, the food banks getting cash was um, was great in a lot of ways in terms of flexibility and a lot of our members um, looking at that kind of cash first ladder that I showed before a lot of our members now are um, offering food vouchers um, instead or alongside um, food parcels that gives people a bit more choice um, but yeah, we no no kind of solid data on that yet, but we are hearing about that being a concern. Thanks so much. Um, that was really useful. There are a couple more sort of other questions in the chat, so if you did want to answer those, that'd be fantastic. But it seemed like people were really uh, engaging really positively with what you're saying, so thank you. Um, okay, um, so our final speaker tonight is Alexa Ward, uh, co-director of Fuel Poverty Action. Um, Alexa, I mentioned in my intro about BP and Shell recording huge profits. So what, is, what actually is the connection between this and the sort of sharp rise that the rest of us are seeing in our energy bills? How are these big energy companies contributing to the cost of living crisis and what can we all do to take them on? Great, thanks so much for having uh, me tonight, Ferg. It's really exciting to be on the new economics briefing. The connection between these astronomical profits. Um, so as you said, Shell and BP are reporting upwards of 
40 billion pounds. I don't even know how to conceptualize that number. I think of that like scrolly GIF that was released a few years ago to try to demonstrate how much wealth Jeff Bezos had, where it shows the average household as a tiny pin prick and you're scrolling for minutes um, to find the end of this. So these are numbers that are really hard to make sense of. But what is easy to make sense of is how disappointed people are to hear that oil and gas companies are profiting so massively when people in their homes are making decisions to not turn on the lights, to stay in bed, to stay warm, uh, to not make a cup of tea, and that this is having real disastrous consequences um, from making so many illnesses way worse. You're talking asthma, you're talking arthritis, it's going to take way longer to get back better from any flu if you're in a cold home, and also death. Like, 10,000 people a year prior to COVID were dying every winter because they couldn't afford to heat their home. And that's just unacceptable uh, in, in a country like the UK. And so what the connection, in addition to being unethical, uh, really shocking, people notice there's a really big tension there, is that it is laying bare uh, how upside down the energy market is and has been for a long time. So Fuel Poverty Action, and I'm going to be talking about this connection through the story of a couple of campaigns in hopes to make these massive numbers a little bit more interesting, and also to talk about how um, some of the middle of the road or piecemeal or some of these smaller insufficient solutions that Miata was mentioning at the beginning are actually doing things to bolster fossil fuel profits and give them even more power and get us even further into a climate crisis when what we need to be doing is uh, helping people and getting away from this. So Fuel Poverty Action has been around for over a decade and was sort of born out of the climate camp, uh, early climate movement in the UK and anti-austerity, anti-poverty campaigning. And this was a group of people, um, this is well before I joined, who wanted to be fighting uh, for climate action, um, but in a way that immediately addressed the uh, impact austerity was having on people's lives in the co context of fuel poverty. And so for the last little while, our campaigns have been trying to link this need um, to figure out what the impact of policies are uh, for people, especially working class people in the UK, uh, as well as tackling the climate crisis and these giant profits that are going to fossil fuel companies. And so we've seen firsthand how the energy market is upside down. Um, for instance, if you're using very little amounts of energy, you're actually paying a lot more per kilowatt hour than someone who's heating a mansion for than someone who's using a lot. And the reason why that's happening is because of the way that the energy pricing system is set up. And there's this thing on your bill, the standing charge that you're going to have regardless of how much you use. And so even if for people who are using down to the bone, trying to use nothing because they can't afford it, um, you're still getting charged automatically. And uh, this is seen most strongly as well in the sort of terms of a prepayment meter. The meter that's uh, sometimes forced upon people, most often forced upon people, or you move into a flat that already has it, if you've been defaulting on payments or you can't uh, pay your direct debits. And it's the, uh, you have to go and top up on your prepayment meter. And if you don't top up, you essentially are self-disconnecting. You might end up in a house without uh, electricity. And the people who are most likely to have those are also those who are most likely to have uh, houses that are in the poorest conditions. And so heat doesn't go very far anyway. And you're ending up with people who just don't have access to electricity. But the thing that is interesting and important when we're linking the money that fossil fuel giants are making right now and this really dire situation uh, that's been going on, not just in the last year, it's gonna get a lot worse and affect a lot more people, but that's been going on for a long time, is that these smaller measures or recommendations that people are saying uh, can act as a subsidy to fossil fuel companies. And so the UK is a, con a country that actually gives a lot of fossil fuel subsidies daily, yearly um, to these giants. They uh, uplift, uh, did some research recently that found a uh, hundred million pounds was given in rebates to Shell in the last year, in addition to Shell making these giant profits. Um, and if you are paying customer bills, if the government steps in to pay customer bills, but there's no stipulations on what's happening with that money, that money is going straight into the pockets of fossil fuel companies. 
And what happens for the climate when fossil fuel companies are making massive profits? Well, that money is reinvested for further exploration and development of oil, which is only worsening the climate crisis when we know that already <laughs> there's too much oil being extracted and already there's too much carbon in the atmosphere. Um, and that's making both situations worse, giving the fossil fuel companies more power to continue to undercut and take advantage of households. So what Fuel Poverty Action has been working up for the last three years, and we've been testing with Tenants and Residents Association who we've had heating campaigns with, and we've been testing with some of the people we've been working in the wake of the Grenfell crisis on cladding and insulation issues and trying to pair that with re retrofit. And we've been testing with our pensioners groups and disabled people against cuts is this idea of energy for all that we need to be walking away from the demands that take the energy market for granted, the one that is continuing to make fossil fuel companies much richer at the expense of the climate and at the expense of us. And we need to be going towards demands that actually show that we need energy to be able to live. Um, and we've been working this idea up. We've been putting it here and there. We weren't sure when to release it. And then the energy crisis hit. And this is an example, I think, of how the energy crisis, although it's a crisis moment in the media, in the press, and it's more on the attention of people, as everyone said, this has been going on for a long time. But what this moment has done is really shift a discourse around what's acceptable. So uh, when we were talking about energy for all last year, it was not getting the attention. And Diane, who's on the call today, the Fuel Poverty Action member, and she sort of launched a petition with Fuel Poverty Action that within 24 hours had 140,000 signatures, within 48 hours had 200,000 signatures on this demand that people should have a basic amount of energy that they need to live to keep the lights on, to keep the heat on, to cook, um, and that should be free. And that can be funded through changes in wealth taxes, it can be funded through windfall taxes, there's all sorts of things that could be done, um, but just the way the current energy system is set up, where fossil fuel companies are only bolstered, both with public money and with money from our own pockets that we barely have to begin with, uh, needs to stop. And uh, that, I guess, uh, is the opening that's come from talking about the crisis recently, is people see this as abhorrent. People are shocked and appalled. It's been like this for a long time, so now we need to start bringing in demands that recognize that this is an unacceptable status quo. Thanks so much, Alexa. Um, that was really, really um, good. Um, I, I just wanted to, the, there's a couple of questions in the chat earlier about net zero um, and, and the merits of using it as a term. And, and there's obviously like this group of conservative MPs known as the net zero scrutiny group. who are trying to persuade the government that we can sort of solve the energy crisis by drilling our own gas and uh, drilling for our own gas in like the North Sea and restart fracking in the UK. And, and linked to that, I guess, is the claim that like net zero policies will hit poorer people hard and benefit the elite. I just wonder how you'd like respond to some of these claims. Is there any like merit in what they're saying at all? And 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 yeah, how, how would you respond to that? I think Lucy's the one who actually has the data to back up whatever response I give. Um, yeah, net zero policies can be done really poorly and hurt people. Uh, absolutely. They can also be done really well and make things better for people. And I think there, as the climate movement, who's also a social justice movement, we need to be paying complete attention to this. And we know, like, um, we know that this is a false choice. We know that really the reliance on fossil capitalism and these giant fossil fuel companies is hurting both the planet and us. Um, but Yes, net zero in a lot of its current iterations, which only bolster the status quo. Yeah, that's gonna that's not gonna be great for people. But there's a lot of iterations of serious and radical action on climate that really is going to make life better for people. Thanks, Lucy. I can see you nodding quite a lot. I wonder if you wanted to quickly come back in and add anything to that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, I finally remembered an example. <laughs> so um, at the moment, I'm working together with Leeds City Council on some other research, and um, th th there's a, they, they have a project in Holt Park in Leeds, which is to radically, radically renovate homes. And it's it's like, I can't remember, the I think it's something like 20 centimetres worth of insulation, um, el electric heat pumps. These are council houses, Leeds, owned, Leeds City Council owned council houses. 
I mean, um, that that can come under the title of net zero uh, um, because I mean that's the way that the, the council frame it, and it's it's funded through Bayes money. Um, those those kinds of of, of kind of radical uh, retrofit initiatives are amazing. I mean, the, the people living in those homes are going to have the, they're going to be feeling the difference between when we talk to somebody that lived there, um, not having the heating all day or on all day, uh, being in bed all day to keep warm, and then suddenly getting the use of your space. And the, the, those those kinds of of of, transform of, of um, changes are really transformatory in people's everyday lives. I think so. Definitely can be done badly and also also can be done extremely well and of course these the, the measures I'm talking about are really expensive but on the other hand you know um if, if in the long term that they really have a, a great benefit great benefits in terms of people's um ability to afford things because it's just all a lot cheaper yeah absolutely yeah. and on that point of uh expensive I think the other point that fuel poverty action has been trying to get across in this crisis is there's plenty of money. Um, what the figures, which are, what's the coincidence that Shell released its figures on the same day they released the price cap rise? Like um, that was created this media storm, but it shows there's plenty of money there. It's just in the wrong places. And so when there's this pushback from more um, conservative perspectives on net zero, oh, these are expensive measures. Well, there's plenty of money. Um, and I think if we all started pointing out where that money is, that would be really helpful for campaigns that are trying to get this across. Thanks so much, both of you. Um, that's nearly all we've got time for um, tonight, actually. So I just want to say thanks again to our wonderful speakers uh, and all of you for coming along. And you know, just a couple of reminders that you can actually get involved um, in campaigning on some of the issues we've covered today. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that the speakers will, will be posting some links as well in, in terms of like how you can get involved in some of the stuff that they've been talking about. But from NEF's side, um, yeah, we are, we are having this parliamentary day of action for our Great Homes Upgrade campaign, which is, which is all about retrofitting, creating good green jobs and solving the climate crisis at the same time. Um, and that's going to happen uh, on, in London on the morning of Wednesday, the 9th much and we'd love for anyone in this call who's around in London or fancies making the trip to London uh, to come down in the morning and join us there um, and sort of show that there's a real popular consensus behind the idea of retrofitting a lot of excitement behind it so we'll post a link to how you get involved in that in the chat and if you can't make that can't make that action uh, but you want to get involved in organizing for a great homes upgrade in your community then it would still be great to speak to you um, we'll post an email that you can get in touch with in the chat as well Finally, just want to say again uh, that if you enjoyed this event and you want to support NEF and our work, you can sign up to our supporters network today from as little as £3 a month. Um, supporters help fund our work, including helping to continue to run events like this and taking the fight for a new economy to the widest audience possible. We'll post the link in the chat again now. Um, I thought it was a really fantastic event. I really enjoyed it. Thanks again so much to the speakers. Thanks for coming. Solidarity, everyone, and see you soon. Mm -hmm.